Ooh, cola, Fanta, Sprite, any energy drink. Almost any aluminum can has the same cylindrical shape. Ever wondered why? Well, imagine you're a manufacturer of a drink, and you have to come up with the most efficient can shape. You want it to be the most convenient for the customer, but you also want to use the least possible material and make sure it uses space wisely. One of the best options would be to make a can into a sphere. To create such a can, you'd need a minimal amount of material. Another pro is that it doesn't have any corners, so the pressure is the same at every point of the can. There are no weak points, and the can will withstand great pressure. Sounds good, but there are a couple of problems. First, a sphere can't stand still. It'll roll off the table, and it's impractical. But even if you make the bottom flat so it can stand, there's one more problem. Imagine you pack all the produced cans in a box to transport them. If you place the cans in the most efficient way possible, still only 74% of space inside the box will be used. The rest will be a void, kind of like my mind. The same applies to store shelves. You can display way fewer products of this shape, so the sphere is really inefficient when it comes to storing liquids. Any other ideas? The most efficient shape for storing and displaying is a cuboid. These cans will take up 100% of space when packed or displayed. Also, the bottom is flat and it can stand very well. The problem is that this shape has many weak spots, the edges. They can break due to the inner pressure or if the can falls down. The engineers came up with something in between the two options, a cylinder shape. It's close to the cuboid shape when it comes to packaging efficiency. It takes up to 91% of the space. At the same time, it doesn't have weak spots, just like a spherical can, because there are no edges. So the choice was obvious, and most manufacturers figured it out. Want to know how a can is made? At first, it looks like this, just a plain aluminum disc. This one is way thicker than the final can, but that's because this is all the material you need to make a can. They place the disc in between two donut-shaped discs with a hole in the middle. Then, a cylindrical punch presses it down, turning the disc into a little cup. This cup is still slightly larger than the final can and is also way shorter, so there are a couple of more steps to go through. You take that large cup and punch out a smaller diameter. Then, the punch once again presses the cup. Now, the cup is smaller in diameter and a bit higher already. A bit more effort, and that's the diameter you need. But it's still too short. The next step is to make the walls a bit thinner. The extra aluminum from the sides will add up to the height of the cup. So another punch pushes the cup through the ironing ring and its walls become thinner and taller. Next, you need to make a dome at the bottom of the cup. The punch pushes the cup into a doming tool. The punch itself has a matching concave indentation. So when pressed, the cup's bottom gets deformed into a dome. Now you need this dome for more efficiency. The doming bottom needs less material than a flat one. Also, it's more resistant to pressure. The curve helps turn some of the vertical pressure into a horizontal one, so the dome can withstand greater pressure than a flat surface. To ensure the pressure is still there, try to squeeze an empty can. It's pretty easy. Now, try to squeeze a full can. It's way harder. That's because there's inner pressure that equally pushes the outside. It also resists your force of squeezing, making it harder to do. Back to the can. After all these deformations, the edges of a can are uneven and wavy. Well, let's cut some of them off to make it nice and even. Time to print the outer design, and the can is almost ready. Most of them have those narrowing necks. To make them, you need to insert an inner die of a smaller diameter than the can into the can body. Then press an outer die around the outside if you can. You can repeat it several times to make sure there can be no wrinkling along the way. Then you can add the top cover, and there you go! Your can is ready! Now you can dance the can-can! Moving on. Any guesses as to what this here is? It's a future plastic bottle. They're made of plastic flakes called PET. They're usually mixed with some flakes of recycled plastic. You can't make a bottle out of recycled plastic alone because it'll lose its important physical properties. This mixture goes into an injection machine that heats it and melts the flakes into a thick liquid. Then another machine pushes the liquid into the mold of a little cylindrical shape with a cooling system, and the things harden immediately. 
so you get those hard, transparent plastic tubes. Then they go into another machine that will heat them a bit, just enough to stretch them. They insert the preform into a mold of a particular shape, the shape of a future bottle. Then air goes out at high pressure to stretch the preform into the needed shape. It then immediately cools the plastic to fix its shape. Plastic bottles have almost flat bottoms, except for a little kink. It's not random. The problem is that the bottle will always have an outwards kink at the bottom that will make it unstable. To avoid it, some air is also pushed inwards from the bottom, creating that small punt at the base of it. And here comes the bottle. They make peanut butter and honey jars the same way. The shapes of the molds can be different, and you can create whatever shape you like out of those preforms. Plastic bottles for soft drinks have five bumps on the bottom. Flat bottoms are common because you need less plastic to produce them. But soft drinks and sparkling water need special treatment. These liquids have internal pressure, you know, the fizz, that pushes the plastic outwards, messing up the punt and the stable form of a bottle. So soda bottles have a curved shape because this way, they're more pressure resistant. Compare folding a regular piece of paper with folding a paper tube. The tube will have more resistance. Curved plastic is also more resistant to any pressure. Glass is made of several natural raw materials. The main components are silica sand that make up around 45% of all the mixture. Soda ash that's around 15% of the mixture makes the silica sand melt evenly. Limestone comprises around 10% and makes the glass more durable. To create a glass bottle, factory equipment first mixes all the needed raw materials and then heats the mixture at the temperature of 2,730 degrees Fahrenheit for the whole day. When it all melts together, it turns into a sticky ooze that's poured out of a machine and gets cut into precise pieces that form a glass bottle. Then each piece of molten glass goes into the first mold that turns it into a parison, a partially formed version of the final product. Then each parison goes into a steel mold that lets you design different shapes. So if you ever want to make your own bottle with some designer cravings, that's the stage you need to add them onto the mold. They heat the parison once again, and the equipment directs compressed air inside, stretching the glass into its final shape. Now the bottle is almost ready. It travels through fire on the way out. If it gets cooled down too fast, a bottle will crack from thermal shock. Yikes! That temperature drop was way too rapid. Same as when you try to pour some ice-cold water onto a heated glass. So the machines cool down the bottle slowly, step by step. And then, once it's cooled down, a glass bottle is ready to go. Glass bottles can be of many different colors, but typically they're white, green, and brown. They get different colors by adding various components to the primary mixture before it heats up. A mix without any additional components will turn out to be a transparent glass bottle or jar. To make the glass brown, you need to add small amounts of iron, sulfur, and carbon to the glass mixture. For a green bottle, you need to add iron, chromium, and copper. Add cobalt oxide and copper, and the bottle will turn out blue. Wow, that sure was a jarring story. Hey, don't blame me.